Now, you have collections. Mm -hmm. How many birds are in the Cleve Museum of Natural History's so, collection? So we have about 35,000 specimens. Uh, a little over 30,000 of those are what we call round skins. And that is where you, you essentially take everything out of a bird, you put cotton inside and sew it up, and you don't pose it like taxidermy, you lay it on its back. And so that's where you open up a cabinet and there might be a tray with maybe a hundred black-capped chickadees in it, um, all laying on their backs. They have tags attached to them, which give the data, which is what makes them really important for us uh, for research. So uh, the vast majority of our collection is round skins, and then we have a few thousand um, complete skeletons, and uh, we actually have a, a group of dermestid beetles that live in our basement that wow. you've seen yeah. um, that uh, strip all the meat off of the skeletons, and we, uh, once they're clean, we can save a complete skeleton for research. Uh, and we also have a few thousand eggs and nests. Wow. So, so the, how about how about the birds that are mounted, you know, posed, at, you know, with eyes and, and pose? Is that in the equation here? It's, or? Technically, it's not. Okay. So, if you if you walk through our, our building, what you see for the public is is taxidermy mounts. Uh, they usually don't have any data associated with them, and so they're really we kind of help curate them, but it's really under the purview of our exhibits folks. Those are are mounted for aesthetic and education reasons, and a researcher couldn't do a whole lot yeah, with okay. them. Right. We have a few kind of edge cases. We have a few birds that were collected in the 1920s, uh, and they were posed in a lifelike way, but then they have a tag attached to them. Huh. And so okay. they're actually really high value for wow. research, wow. but they still look great, so we can use them for exhibits <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah. And you get collections in from uh, other organizations, like I think there's some colleges that may have donated things as well. Yeah, so our, our collections still grow, mm -hmm. and some of that is through donations. Um, our most significant growth recently that way was the Kingman Museum in Michigan. Um, they are a smaller museum and decided it doesn't make sense for them to have a thousand research specimens. And so they donated their whole collection wow, to us. Wow, nice, real nice. Um, and occasionally, you know, somebody is cleaning out the the attic of their parents or grandparents, and they suddenly find ten grouse or something up there that have been mounted. And if they have data, that's actually something we do oh, occasionally take okay. on. A lot of times, they're just dusty and don't have much data, yeah, so right, they're they're right, not for us. Right. Um, so you know, we get people curious about well, why did they have to kill these birds? Why are there so many of a particular? like chickadees in a, in a drawer, yeah. um, you, why can't they take photographs? So, mm -hmm. so what's the purpose of these collections and, and how are they used here and maybe some, by somebody else? Yeah, so we're here to document diversity. Uh, we document today's diversity and we also document the history of diversity. So we have house sparrows in our collection and people don't get very excited when they see house sparrows. but. We have house sparrows from the last few years. We have house sparrows from the early 1900s. And if you lay them in a tray side by side, you obviously can see the 100-year-old ones because they were keeping warm by getting up against buildings in Cleveland. And the soot from the buildings wow. just covered them in, in sort of this dusky layer of huh. junk. And so that tells you a little bit about uh, changing air conditions and uh, uh, climate conditions. Mm -hmm. We have been talking with a student who's wanting to come by and take almost like a piece of scotch tape and stick it to some of the feathers, peel off that particulate matter, and then they can actually put it under a microscope and quantify wow. the kinds of gunk that was getting wow. on the house sparrows. Wow. Wow. So, and, and into people too, so you could kind of correlate well, sure. to what yeah. people were breathing in. Yeah, Holy so the, the birds were putting their heads right in the middle of it, but people were working right downtown too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and so that's, that's one little example of the kind of work that can be done with these specimens. But um, we can't do that with just five specimens. We need lots of individuals within a species. And so the black-capped chickadee example, I think, is a good one. Um, we have probably three or 400 black-capped chickadees in our collection. Some of those are very recent. Some uh, go back more than 100 years. And so we can use them to look at change through time in that species. Yeah. Uh, we also use it to look at changes from place to place. Mm -hmm. So we have them not just from the Cleveland area, but from Michigan, from Minnesota, from Colorado, from North Carolina. And just like people don't look the same from place to place, black-capped chickadees do not look the same as you go from place huh. to place. 
Um, and That's so, interesting because, you know, you look in a field guide, you look at a bird, oh, it's a black-capped chickadee. They yep. look all the same. Yeah, they, they do on, on first brush, mm -hmm. but when you start looking at them, and then a lot of times we're doing more specific measurements. Sure. Um, and on a lot of our black-capped chickadees, we've actually cut one of the wings off of the specimen. We completely spread it open, and it's, it dries out like that, and you can actually measure every single feather on the wing. Uh, we're doing that to look at sort of uh, dispersal ability. Hmm. If you have a long pointy wing, okay. you can disperse a long wow. way. Wow. If you don't have that kind of wing, you don't disperse as hmm. far. That's interesting. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we want to uh, show changes through time. We want to show variation from place to place. And then we also want to preserve this because we don't know how people are going to use these specimens later. Um, my favorite example is the peregrine falcon story with the DDT and DDE and dieldrin where these pesticides were introduced to the ecosystem and eventually that made its way into the prey base of the peregrines. That interfered with their ability to put calcium into bone structure as well as their eggshells. Oh, wow. So when they try and incubate their eggs, they were cracking their eggs open. Of course, this is in the mid-1900s. Um, and so we had kind of the smoking gun story, right? The DDT connection with thinner eggshells. But we needed to go to a natural history museum to show that there truly was a thinning of eggshells through time. Wow. And so we needed eggshells from the late 1800s, the early 1900s, and the mid 1900s. And so researchers did that. They went to natural history museums wow. and pulled these eggshells and measured how thick they were. And that showed absolutely there's a, the eggshells were the same thickness for decade after decade. And then all of a sudden you introduce these pesticides and the eggshells got thinner. Yeah. Yeah. And some, poor schmuck had to climb down a, the face of a cliff in the 1800s wow. to retrieve one of these eggs. And they were doing that for a research project that would take place decades after they wow. themselves yeah. passed away. Who would, who would have thought? They, they were studying a, a technology that didn't exist yeah. yet. Yeah. And Absolutely. so every time we prepare a specimen, we think this could be really important for a project tomorrow or a hundred years from yeah. now. Yeah, wow, yeah. Who, who thinks that far ahead now? Is, yeah. um, so, birds, nests and eggs, um, what, what do you have as far as nests and eggs? Oh, what, you know what, I, what's the biggest bird that you have in the collection? Biggest bird is an ostrich. Oh, an ostrich. Yeah, we have a full specimen. It's, uh, it would be too large to fit into our cabinets, except when they prepared the bird, they actually uh, folded the legs underneath it and put the head on top. It's a very awkward looking ostrich, but that's the only way we can preserve it. And that it. was that collected somewhere it's or actually, was it a zoo? It's a Cleveland Zoo. A zoo. Yeah. yeah. So it's when the birds pass away mm -hmm. at the, the zoo and at local rehab centers, they okay. freeze them and they give them to okay. us. All right. So we yeah. can still make uh, research sure. specimens yeah, that's, from them. That's good. Yeah. As long as there's data. Yes, yes. exactly. As long as yep. there's data. And they're very good about that. Good. We've, good, we've good, had good. lots of conversations uh -huh. to, to... How about the there. tiniest? The smallest. We have a lot of hummingbirds. Okay. Uh, we have hummingbirds from all over the Americas. Uh, we do not have uh, the, the uh, Cuban uh, bee hummingbird. Okay. We, we have a few that are closely related to it though and they're, I mean, they're just ridiculously <laughs> tiny. Yeah. yeah, I actually uh, uh, was storing one of them in the cabinet with the ostrich just oh. so when I showed people through the collection I could pull out the little hummingbird yeah, exactly. right next oh, to that's, the ostrich. That's fantastic. You know, you have that huge diversity of huge things like ostrich through the littlest things like the hummingbirds and, and some of the kinglets and warblers and right, right. fantastic.